Pardon? I'm going to introduce you. Oh, you're going to introduce me? Then I'm in real trouble. <laughs> My name is Mark Lee. I'm a trustee of the Krishnamurti Foundation. And we welcome you to this very special talk this evening by Professor Ravi Ravindra. This hall where we are uh, meeting is Pine Cottage, or now we call it the Krishnamurti Library. And it was here where Krishnamurti lived and passed away. Regularly, we have activities in this hall, talks, dialogues, and meetings. And there is a complete library of Krishnamurti's books here in English and about 20 foreign languages for people who'd like to come and study the teachings. Dr. Ravindra is a very old friend of the Foundations and an even older friend of Krishnamurti's. He knew Krishnamurti personally quite well for many, many decades and had the good fortune of having dialogues and conversations and uh, walks with Krishnamurti in the last uh, 20, 30 years of his life. Ravi has also authored several books with reference to Krishnamurti, in addition to several others on other topics that he speaks on uh, internationally. He's a former professor of religion and physics from Dal. Housie University in Nova Scotia, Canada. The reason it's such a pleasure to have Ravi speak with us tonight, uh, there are several reasons. The main reason is that as a, an old friend and someone who was familiar with Krishnamurti, he understands Krishnamurti from many, many perspectives. And he is not afraid to ask critical questions about both the teachings and the teacher. So it's, which is an important dimension as the years progress after Krishnamurti's passing that we are we continue to look at the teachings and the teacher with a, uh, an intelligent, critical eye. So, welcome, Ravi Ravindra. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Since I will be basically speaking about Krishnamurti and tradition, let me therefore begin with a remark from one of the oldest Upanishads. And the reason I mention this, because in my understanding, it is at the heart of Krishnamurti's teaching also. The remark is very simple. When a person is done with learning, he returns to himself. This is a very old Upanishad. And for Krishnamurti, this was really heart of the teaching to return to oneself, not on relying on this or that, this teaching or that teaching, but to impartially look what you are, where you are, what stands in your way, what calls you, and why is it that you're not able to do what you wish to do, etc. Repeatedly he came to this, and therefore very often emphasized the requirement for an impartial self-study. He used several other expressions like self-inquiry, sometimes self-knowledge, various other expressions, so not to get occupied with one expression or the other. 
In fact, he very strongly makes this remark that unless that self-inquiry is the heart of wisdom, there can be no wisdom without self-inquiry. And this is really the call when a person returns to oneself to see deeply inside what stands in my way, what I am, and then one returns to the fundamental questions of any spiritual teaching. Who am I? If I simply remind everybody here of the obvious fact, Krishnamurti didn't necessarily speak about that particular way. You, I, we did not create ourselves enormously large forces are running the whole universe. And of course, from a spiritual point of view, the remark is repeatedly made by all the sages, including by Krishnamurti in one way or the other, that these forces are not just random, that they are conscious forces running the universe. Whether one labels them as God or Allah or something, or the absolute or simply that, labels are, they vary from culture to culture. But if I can actually recall occasionally even to remind myself that I did not create myself, this already re inevitably, at least for me, raises a question, why have I been created? And hardly forever, none of us are going to be here in a few decades. So these kinds of questions are inevitably brought forth if one returns to oneself, looks at oneself seriously. But here, I should also tell you, I'm not going to be mostly talking about what Krishnamurti's books say or what he even gave in public talks. I, had, I was very fortunate to have met him many times. It was actually a great privilege for me to spend time with him. He was a very remarkable human being. There is hardly any question in anybody's mind here. And so I will be basically talking about some of the exchanges which I had with him. And because some of his teaching actually is very deeply related with all of these exchanges. We were not just talking about how, what is the price of the potatoes. That's not our concern. <laughs> that's, that's not what we were speaking about. So let me begin. On one occasion, this was actually, if I recall correctly, 1981. Just having a walk with him. Much to my surprise, he sort of turned around, he says, what do you think is wrong with India? Now, I should tell you that for several decades before that, I was trying to reform him, because trying to agree, disagree, trying to say they're different. But by this time, I had already come to the understanding that I needed to just listen to him rather than trying to reform him. So I just... <laughs> so I just, I stopped and I looked at him. He says, the trouble with India is that the Brahmins have forgotten the tradition. Now, generally, both in the Krishnamurti circle as well as outside, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively, the attitude is that he was very much against the tradition, that he didn't want to support the tradition. And to some extent, it is actually true. Partly because I remember at least on two occasions in my hearing, he mentioned the etymological root of the word tradition. You look in a large Oxford dictionary, it comes from the Latin tradir, which also means to betray. So from his point of view, the tradition just betrays the truth. <laughs> he occasionally would mention this, indicating the root of these words, but it also means to deliver which is another way of the tradition is delivered from one stage to another or from one person to another. But in this particular instance, I was a little surprised by him saying that the trouble with India is that the Brahmins have forgotten the tradition. And therefore, it is important to understand what is the tradition he's speaking about. And it is absolutely true. In every culture, it depends on what we mean by the tradition. Is the tradition what the priests are saying, what they are eating, what they are asking you to do? Is that the tradition? Or if we stayed, let us say for a moment, with the Indian tradition, is what Ramakrishna said or did, or what Raman did, or what Vivekananda did, or before that Yagyavalakya, or Kabir, or Nanak, what they did, is that the tradition? 
What is the tradition? Hmm? Similarly, if you look at the Judeo-Christian world here, is the tradition simply what the cardinals who have now been put in jail, is that the tradition? <laughs> or the tradition which Frank, what Frank, uh, maybe John of the Cross did, or Teresa of Avila, or any of the other great sages in the Christian tradition, or in the Jewish, or the Islamic, what Rumi did or said. So, it really very much depends on what is meant by the tradition. It is absolutely true that every tradition is actually betrayed sooner or later by people. But what is at the heart of the tradition is, I will speak a little bit more about this in a few moments, and that was very much the emphasis that Krishnamurti brought. And personally, in my understanding, he was one of the very few people coming from India who actually, in fact, followed the tradition. People may not like to put it like that, because that seems as if he's just following something or the other. Now, part of the tradition, any serious tradition, really is that it assists you to transcend the tradition. Every teaching, some of you have heard me make this remark earlier, every teaching at its best is like a finger pointing to the moon. If you get so attached to the finger, you can never get to the moon. So the tradition succeeds precisely when it allows a person to move beyond the tradition. It is pointing to something, but it cannot carry you there. It, one needs to move, returning to oneself, as the Upanishad says. Having learned many things, a serious person returns to oneself. So now, I will take a few other examples of various meetings with him in one way or the other. And then there is also a question gets raised, in what tradition would we place Krishnamurti? Now here, let me first of all remind you, there were actually about 16 or 18 volumes under a big title called World Spirituality, an Encyclopedic History of Religious Quest. They had two volumes on Hinduism, two on Christianity, two on Islam, etc., on every religion they had. In the two volumes on Hinduism, the first volume is called From the Vedas to Vedanta, and the second volume is called Modern Flowerings. Now, so I suggested to them to include an article on Krishnamurti among the modern flowerings. Now here is an indication by some of these scholars there who were responsible for these volumes. They said, but Krishnamurti is not interested in the tradition. You see, they have the same attitude as some people within the Krishnamurti teaching also have that attitude that he's against the tradition. Similarly, people outside have that attitude. But in any case, finally they agreed and had decided to publish an article on this. And Krishnamurti was still alive. This was, the volume was actually published after his death, but they were gathering the material, I think, in about 1984 or something like this. So since he was still alive, and since I was writing this article about Krishnamurti, I decided to check with him, would he agree with what I'm saying? And I basically spoke with him and I said, am I right that at the heart of your teaching is intelligence beyond thought. And I was really, I must say, I was rather surprised by his response. Maybe he has said this to everybody else, but I, nobody else has reported this. He said to me, you know, he had a habit of saying, sir, uh, sir, if you speak from your heart, whatever you say I said, I will agree I have said it. Now, that actually placed an enormous responsibility on me. Mm -hmm. Am I now going to speak from my heart? He said, whatever you say I have said, I will agree that I have said it. Now, intelligence beyond thought is really absolutely at the root of all spiritual teachings. Constant reminder that there are many levels of reality subtler than the thought, subtler than mind. The word mind is a little tricky in the English language because whether we are talking about the monkey mind or the Buddha mind, we just end up using one word, mind. And in classical languages, such as in Sanskrit, we had two different words, 
manas for the ordinary mind and buddhi, same root as the word buddha, speaking about, if you like, intelligence beyond thought, <laughs> but speaking about, one may say, higher mind, buddha mind, whatever other label one wants to attach to. Similarly, in Greek, ancient Greek, you have nous, N-O-U-S, for higher mind, dianoia for usual, ordinary, analytical mind. So Krishnamurti is not against thought. In fact, he even speaks about to come to real thought, <laughs> to clear thought, etc. That is the call. So very strong suggestion in the whole of the Indian tradition, not only in the Indian tradition, but actually in all spiritual tradition, but very much emphasized in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and in the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, the very first substantial sutra in the Yoga Sutra, let me quote it to you, it's actually the second sutra in the first chapter, Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is stopping all the movements of the mind. Very strong call. In fact, personally, I think just the very word to say something is spiritual, it is almost automatically to assume that it is beyond mind, that the mind cannot quite grasp this. And but the spiritual realm is very large realm. I need to keep reminding people of this. For example, in the Bible, you have nine orders of angels. They are all spiritual, <laughs> but there are large categories or different levels of angels. Similarly, in the Indian tradition, many levels of the devas, devas sometimes gets translated as angels, but it's really not an appropriate translation. It's slightly different characteristics in both cases. But in any case, the point really to be made is this. The suggestion that there is an intelligence beyond thought is absolutely at the core of all spiritual teachings. Very much emphasized, as I just said, in the Yoga Sutra, which is associated with actually practicing something, not simply talking about it. Similarly, the Bhagavad Gita. Just to remind you, Aldous Huxley, who was a fairly close friend of Krishnamurti, as a matter of fact, he actually speaks about the Bhagavad Gita as the perennial or the paradigm example of perennial philosophy. Because precisely these texts are actually dealing with their call about various levels of reality and how to approach them, what practices are required, etc. So the suggestion from Krishnamurti that people have forgotten the tradition is absolutely right. If one understands the tradition, at the usual kind of low level that gets called, well, that's the Hindu tradition or that's the Christian tradition. So uh, we should be, uh, Christian tradition is that nobody else can go to salvation except unless you go to the church. So if that's the tradition, it's obviously stupid to follow that. <laughs> and so one needs to be very clear what is being understood by the word tradition, the Krishnamurti. So personally, in my judgment, he was one of the very few people actually who in fact followed the tradition. Very strong emphasis on self-study. This is absolutely at the root of any serious search. Until I see what stands in my way, what calls me, why I am unable to do what I decide to do, how can I make any progress of any kind and understanding? So a very, for example, in the Yoga Sutras, again, I mentioned here, the Sanskrit word is Swadhyaya, literally means self-study. And it's repeated more than once in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Yoga Sutras. I mentioned just these two texts partly because I'm more familiar with them, but partly because they're at the heart of the actual spiritual practice in the Indian tradition. And so self-study or self-inquiry was very strongly recommended by Krishnamurti. Who could possibly be against this? It is actually absolutely at the heart of any spiritual search. And, but it is true, sadly sometimes these things don't get expressed in the usual churchly fashion, but even there I remind my Christian friends, for example, in a non-canonical gospel, Gospel of Thomas, here is a call for self-study. The kingdom of God is within you and outside you. If you would know God, you must know yourself. When you know yourself, you will be known 
and you will realize that you are the sons of the living father. If you do not know yourself, you are in poverty. In fact, you are poverty. In fact, I don't actually know a stronger statement, a stronger call for self-study than this one. This is in the Gospel of Thomas, non-canonical to be sure. But because the churches, etc., don't necessarily encourage any serious practice. They just wish you to believe something, have faith in something or the other, which was, this is the reason Krishnamurti was repeatedly reminding people not to get stuck with this. But now, let me even mention this to you, how cultures degenerate. This word swadhyay, there is no complexity about it. It's just made of two words in Sanskrit. Anybody knowing even the most elementary Sanskrit would know. Swa plus adhyay, self-study. But if you look at the contemporary Sanskrit English dictionaries, they give first translation of that as studying sacred books. Only third or fourth translation is self-study. And I remember in a conversation with Krishnaji, by the way, we used to call him Krishnaji. To call him Mr. Krishnamurti would be strange <laughs> from our point of view. And to just simply call him Krishna would be slightly rude. So Krishnaji is a very standard expression. Both affection as well as respect. It's a subtle combination of the two, actually. And so I was telling this to Krishnaji that what has happened to the culture. And <laughs> he didn't usually use this kind of language, but he says, damn it, sir, what is the point of studying sacred books unless you study the book of yourself? Hmm? But again and again, the call from any serious searcher, and Krishnamurti was obviously a serious searcher, this could hardly be doubted, call to impartially study oneself. And behind that is a very important principle, which I don't recall him especially speaking about it very much, but you consider it, that awareness is actually the mechanism of transformation. If I can impartially, steadily watch, let us say that I am greedy, not to be even for or against it, but to impartially watch this deeply and to see how this arises in me, what function it has, what does it do for me, gradually you will become free of greediness. Awareness is the mechanism of transformation, which is why so much emphasis on self-study, not just quickly saying, oh yeah, my name is this. That's not the kind of self-study we are talking about. <laughs> deeper and deeper look at what stands in my way, what calls me, and always a very strong suggestion by all the teachings, spiritual teachings, that this body, including the mind, I just use the word body for convenience speaking, is created by a spiritual element for its own purpose. Because the, in the spiritual teachings, the suggestion is that the whole manifested universe comes about by involution. By involution I mean starting from the highest level of consciousness coming to lower and lower levels, right up to the rocks and the stones. This is completely contradictory to the modern scientific perspective, where everything in the universe begins from dead matter, somehow some particles coming together, then bigger particles, and then we get life somehow begin, then somehow consciousness begins, etc. But it begins from the lowest level of consciousness. Therefore, from a physics point of view, which is the queen of all the sciences, everything ultimately should be expressed in terms of matter in motion. So, everything material is coming from the matter side. This is completely contrary to all the spiritual teachings. And therefore, the suggestion is that a particle of, we can call it the spirit or particle of divinity, that has created my body, for its purposes, not for the purpose of the body. 
And the purpose is because it is needing to evolve to come back to the source which created it. Ultimately to come back to God, to come back to the One. Now Krishnamurti, at least in my hearing, didn't specifically ever mention this kind of aim, but it was always implied by his teaching that one needs to find one's relationship with the subtlest realities full of, he would often use the expression, truth, love and beauty, hmm? which is, are the attributes attributed to the very highest level of consciousness or to God, etc. So the call really is that my body, including the mind, under needs, needs to undertake appropriate actions that it can assist the evolution of this particle of divinity that has taken on my body. Now, the trouble is, as I ordinarily give this very simple example, the whole purpose of a magnetic needle is to point to the north, magnetic north. But if there are distracting magnets, it cannot point to the magnetic north. So the whole purpose of this particle of divinity, let's use the word soul temporarily, but the, every word has lots of complexity to it, so I'm a little hesitant using it. But let's say the purpose of the soul is to point or to assist us to return back home, return to the source. But there are very many distracting magnets around. All our education, all our social conditioning has to do with competition. How can I gain more? How can I get a Nobel Prize if you're working in the sciences? Or how can I get to a better college, better house, etc. Entire social per practice is occupied with this. Therefore, sometimes, including Krishnamurti, occasionally just wants you to get rid of the world, just forget the job, etc., etc. That is not necessary in my judgment to do. This will be one of my points of disagreement with him. But nevertheless, the suggestion is to find one's right purpose for existence. What is the purpose of my life? And to see that sooner or later, if one actually stays with this kind of a question, one wishes to hear what this spiritual element, why it has come into this body, what is it that I can do to assist the evolution of this particle of divinity, etc. But none of this is an easy project, which is why one needs to remember that the entire purpose of any spiritual practice is enhancement of the quality of our being, so that we can become slightly more aware than we usually are, slightly more compassionate than we are, more loving than we are, more a sense of service, more a sense of unity with the others, Otherwise, we won't regard a person as a sage. Why would we bother to listen to Krishnamurti if he did not have some of these qualities manifested? So one needs to be clear why somebody is called a sage or a great teacher or a wise person, precisely because they are manifesting some of these characteristics. And that is the entire purpose of any spiritual undertaking. It's not to study bigger books or quote the Upanishads, the Rig Veda. There is no reason to be against knowledge, but the whole purpose of knowledge from a spiritual point of view, can it assist me to in fact enhance the quality of my being? Otherwise, whether E is equal to MC square or MC cube, it doesn't change anything in my life. Scientific enterprise is wholly occupied with knowledge. Some of the scientists have, they were good people, nice, compassionate people. I have personally met many Nobel Prize winners, especially in physics, which is my own background. But some of them, quite terrible people. You wouldn't want to invite them home for tea, I can guarantee. <laughs> because the quality of their being has nothing to do with the quality of their scientific progress, scientific work. Because that's not the call, and they don't undertake any self-study, I can guarantee that too. Hmm? Because that is not their call. Hmm? So one needs to be very clear, we are talking about two completely different enterprises, which is why Krishnamurti, in fact, even makes this my, a remark. He, used, he often would call the religious mind. Some of you have heard this. I even said to him on one occasion that these days, 
to say somebody has a religious mind is really to say he's bigoted. Why don't you use something like spiritual mind? He says, no, no, just because they are wrong doesn't mean I should not use this expression. So he always used the word religious mind. <laughs> so from his point of view, the religious mind is not against the scientific mind. That will be quite silly to be against it. The spiritual undertaking is not against knowledge, but it is not occupied with that kind of knowledge, any kind of knowledge. Even studying the Upanishad, studying the Bible, or nobody is against any of this. But I can assure you, although Krishnamurti would often, let me actually give you one particular example again. On one occasion, I was very struck by the Song of Songs in the Bible. And just a few hours later, I happened to meet Krishnamurti, so I mentioned it to him. He says, that was my most favorite book in the Bible. And then, partly coming from an academic background, I mentioned to him that Rabbi Akiva, a great rabbi in the Jewish tradition, had actually, because even in the Jewish tradition and particularly in the Christian tradition, for example, Martin Luther wanted to get that book out of the Bible because it has some sexual innuendos in it. Like Geet Govind in India, if you're familiar with Geet Govind. And so some of them want to take it out of the Bible. So Rabbi Akiva had said that the day, that all the days are holy, but the day this book was given to Israel is the holiest of all days. He was a great admirer of this book. So Krishnamurti quite understandably liked it. But the moment I mentioned this is, I haven't read your Bible. Let me assure you, consistency is not something you need to get too attached to Krishnamurti. <laughs> Because he didn't want to engage in this academic kind of a conversation, but otherwise he just finished saying to me hardly two minutes earlier that this was his most favorite book in the Bible. <laughs> so, I call again and again to remind you, for example, let me mention this, another example here. I'm partly trying to relate this all with the classical tradition and See, if you later on remind me of any of the major remarks of Krishnamurti, I will tell you where you can find this in the Bible or in the Upanishads or in the Bhagavad Gita or the Yoga Sutra. Everything that you can mention. I will speak about a few of those items here. One is, on one occasion, I, first of all, was, it was a conference. They had a tendency or a practice to invite about a dozen people to have what they called a dialogue with Krishnamurti. And then hundreds could be around, but they were not expected to say anything or even to applaud or to say, to do anything. Just they needed to be quietly just listening to it. So I happened to be one of the persons invited there. And you know, various people are saying something or the other. And I had just come from Canada, coming to India. It's not next door. And I wanted to listen to what Krishnamurti had to say. So I ended up saying, I said, I said, sir, you are the cat with the meat. You should tell us. Now these are all vegetarians. I didn't, somehow this expression came out of my, I said, you are the cat with the meat. You should say something. And he started laughing. And then somebody there was getting a little annoyed with my remark, Pupul Jayakar, by the way. And he was so angry with her. I was completely surprised. He asked her to shut up, listen. And... So then I asked him some questions and I said, you keep saying this, but none of this is actually quite speaking to what we are asking. He said, why do you come then if this? I said, because I love you. I don't know from where it came. This is, now here is the public occasion. And what I ended up saying, because I love you. <laughs> that, that was one of our exchanges. And then on one occasion, some of you know this, especially those people who actually met Krishnamurti in person. Very few are now left who actually met with him at a, at a long time. And he had a very, conveyed a very democratic attitude, as if everybody can come to this level. This must have been his training in England, I think, at early 20th century. And I said to him, sir, this is impossible. The kind of level that you're speaking from is not so ordinary. He said, do you think I'm a freak? <laughs> now, freak can mean somebody who's badly 
brought up or bad somewhere, but it can also make, mean something completely unusual, hmm? extraordinary. I said yes. So that, that, that in a way, because you see it could be understood <laughs> in either way. But then I said, if you think we all have the same kind of mind, let us act. This was in fact in this very room here. There was a table there. There happened to be a vase with some flowers sitting there. And there were two chairs there. So we both sat there. And I said to him, sir, you look at this flower and tell me what comes through about it in your mind. And I will look at it and I will tell you what comes in my mind. If you think we are both at the same level, then we can just test it. So he looks at this flower and he says, my mind is like a mill pond. Any impression rises, creates a little wave, but very soon the wave disappears and the quietness comes. Then he looked at me very mischievously and he said, and sir, your mind is like a mill. I have actually written an article about this called Mill and the Mill Pond, is the title of that article. <laughs> and, and even Pupul Jaikar, who was not a great fan of mine, in one of her books she included that article, in one of the books she edited. Yeah. But clearly there was an enormous difference really between the quality of his mind and the whole call, particularly emphasized in the Yoga Sutras, not to be against the mind, but mind is not the real knower. Mind is an instrument, but like the telescope is not the real knower, scientist is the knower, knowing through the telescope, but then you can have a bad telescope or a good telescope. So our mind can be refined, quietened. In fact, the example of the particular illustration that Patanjali uses in the Yoga Sutras, the mind can become like a clear diamond so that it does not introduce any color of its own. So whatever it looks at has just reveals the color of the object completely objectively. That's that. So my impression is that Krishnamurti's mind was more like a clear diamond as far as I can judge. Of course one also needs to realize whenever we say any of these things do I have the capacity to judge this? I don't know that. I don't have that power, that, on, that level. But one can sometimes feel something or be touched by something. My impression certainly was. In fact, on one occasion, I even remember asking him, we were just sitting somewhere, actually. I don't even recall where it was. And I don't know what the object, I just simply asked him, Krishnaji, what do you think of this? He said, the speaker, sometimes he referred to himself as the speaker, or sometimes as K. I'm just reminding those of you. I'm sure you people, of course, know all this, but others may not know this. He says, the speaker doesn't think. He just looks. Hmm? I mention this because there is always this very strong suggestion. In fact, that is really what makes a sage. A sage is not saying something they have read or heard or thought about, something they have directly perceived. Direct perception is the very characteristic of a sage saying something. Very standard remark in the, actually in the Bible, Christ spoke as one with authority, not as the scribes do. A way of just mentioning. Because when they speak, naturally they speak with authority because they're saying what they actually see. They're not something they have heard or read about or something. And so his remark was very interesting. The speaker doesn't think, he just looks. <laughs> and that is really the call very much here. And maybe I mentioned some other exchanges with him. This will take a little background, but not long. On one occasion, my wife and I were returning from a conference in Hawaii, and we had to change flights overnight in Los Angeles, 
and then take flight to Halifax, which is 4,000, four hours time difference between here and there, just to remind you. So it's a very far away. And Krishnamurti had actually said to me occasionally, or quite often as a matter of fact, whenever you can come, please come and see me. Actually on one occasion he said, especially I should mention it to people from Kratona Institute, because they would often invite me here and would pay for my airfare. He says, let them pay for your airfare, airfare and then you sneak out and see me. <laughs> this is Krishnamurti saying to me, then you sneak out and see me. And so I guess I had sneaked out on one occasion to come and see him. And so, but then when I was passing through Los Angeles, I thought he, I wasn't sure whether he was in Ohio at that time or not. And so I called Mary Zimbalist, who actually said to me, well, he's here, but he's very tired because for the last three or four days he's been giving strong public talks here. And if any of you actually heard him in person, he always spoke with a great passion, with a lot of energy. And so I'm, I was not surprised that he was tired, especially for three or four successive days he's been doing this. And so she thought maybe this is not a good time to come. So I was obviously feeling a little disappointed that he's here, but I can't come. Then she calls me back saying, I know he'll be happy to see you, but promise you won't raise anything serious. <laughs> and I promised. So we come here and <laughs> at lunchtime, I'm sitting on his left side Mary Zimbalist is sitting on his right side and my wife is sitting opposite and there must have been one or two other people I don't actually recall. Maybe you were there, Mark, I don't actually recall this, but at that particular occasion, this is 1980, I think January or February, something close to this. In any case, he was not, eat he was 85 years old then. He was not, not eating very much, maybe, maybe any day, but certainly that day he was not eating very much and throughout lunch, he kept holding my right hand. So I have to eat with my left hand, which I'm not at all accustomed to. <laughs> throughout lunch, he kept holding my right hand. And then, both Mary Zimbalist and myself, because we were both trying to not to have anything serious, so we said, oh, it's a nice sunny day, and maybe after lunch we might have a little nap and then go for a little walk or, you know, the kind of usual mumbo jumbo so that nothing serious is being spoken about. But then I have absolutely no idea of what happened from where, see there are always other forces are at play. Something just more or less emerged from me. I just said, Krishnaji, it seems to me that every impression changes our body at a cellular level and that a new body is required for a new consciousness. He turns to me, should we go into, sir? Go into it, sir? And Mary Zimbalist is looking at me with dragon eyes. <laughs> I have clearly betrayed my promise. <laughs> so we both then try to say, Krishna Ji, we need a little rest maybe afterward. No, he actually, I have never seen anybody so angry at anybody really as Krishnamurti was angry at Mary, Mary Zimbalis. Asked her to shut up. You don't know what is serious, what is important. Now imagine that, saying this to her. But then he sent somebody to bring a tape recorder and now, and I am feeling so bad because I have clearly betrayed my promise to Krishna. But from where it emerged, one always need to remember there are many devils are also working, not only, not only the angels. And, but in any case, now I was feeling so bad that after the conversation about which I had no longer any choice, we actually, otherwise the idea was that we'll stay in Ohio and next morning we'll catch our flight. Now I decided to go back to Los Angeles, we have to rent a hotel for the night, etc. So then we, next morning we fly. Three days later, the phone rings. My wife answers the phone and says, the, this sound sounds very familiar, but very formal. He's saying, may I speak to Professor Ravindra? You know, in Canada or USA, there is not that kind of practice to be Professor Ravindra. Not that kind of formality. 
and it's Krishnamurti on the phone. Now, where did he get my phone number? I have no idea. Why wouldn't he have Mary Zimbalist or somebody else call and then give him the... I have absolutely no idea how he got hold of my phone and why would he call me and not ask anybody else to call and give it. So this is what he said. What you had said three days ago, I have been thinking about it. Can you come and see me for half an hour? No, it's 4,000 miles away. It's only Krishnamurti who could say that. <laughs> but you know, an iron filing does not know how to avoid going to a magnet. I actually had a conference a week later in London, England, so I flew from Halifax to London via Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> And I came to see him here. And there, a few years before that, a, a journal which was just starting had asked me to write an article about Krishnamurti. But I decided at that time to write him like a letter to Krishnamurti, rather than as a kind of a whole article about him. And I was, quite, of course, it was published in this journal, but I was sure that. Krishnamurti hasn't seen it, or I mean, many people would probably write, I have no idea. I'm imagining that many people must be writing to him or sending him letters. He wasn't. So now, since I, since I was invited by him, I thought I will give him a copy of this letter and ask him what he thinks. The reason I mainly wanted to talk about this was because, as you know, Krishnamurti so often emphasized, sometimes this expression gets quoted again and again, that Truth is a pathless land. This was, if you like, almost what started his break away from the Theosophical Society. By the way, here, this is something he himself said to me. He never left the Theosophical Society, he said. I never left it. They kicked me out, which is actually true. I discovered later on, I asked Radha Bernier, who was the president of the International Theosophical Society, and apparently that is actually true, that the person... Annie Besant was still officially the president, but she had lost her memory. So um, Arundel, I've forgotten his first name, um, Arundel in any case was officially acting as the president. And he was quite annoyed with Krishnamurti for varieties of reasons. I don't want to go into the details of that. He literally put his suitcase on the, on the path there taking it out of his room. So it is actually true what Krishnamurti said. He didn't leave the Theosophical Society, they kicked him out. <laughs> so, Radha Bernie herself was surprised actually when she discovered this, this was actually the truth. In any case, so then I get the notion that truth is a pathless land can be understood and obviously everybody has one's own shtick. They understand it differently. That doesn't mean that there is no journey, there is no path. But it's not path devised by somebody else. It's not a, that there is a whole re religion about it or a teaching about it, and this is the direction you have to follow. So I had written in that letter at the end, actually, that I can understand that there is no way from here to there, but is there a way from there to here? So when I gave him this letter, he said he will read it. And next morning, I should first of all tell you people here, this may surprise some of you, he cooked breakfast for me just in this kitchen outside this room here. And I tell my Indian friends especially, because in India, eggs are regarded as non-vegetarian. I keep reminding them that Mahatma Gandhi also used to eat eggs. Krishnamurti used to eat eggs. He actually made omelette for me in the morning here for breakfast. And so... Some of my Indian friends are a bit surprised by this, but isn't this the common habit in India? They imagine eggs to be also not, they are also non-vegetarian. But this somehow becomes a cultural habit actually. But in any case, so he said after breakfast then we had a conversation in this room here actually, and uh, he said he was particularly interested in the very last sentence that I had in that letter. That's the reason I mentioned the last sentence. And he says, that's what he's been teaching for the last 60 years. 
one needs to understand a very strong suggestion in all serious teachings it gets actually particularly emphasized in the Quran more than in any other scripture at least in my reading that God is seeking us more than we are seeking God very strong suggestion that if one takes even one step towards God God will take ten steps towards you this is the remark from the Quran but the impression that one can from this side figure God out or the ultimate reality out it's not no spiritual teacher could possibly agree with this but serious teachings are coming from the other side so no way from here to there but from there to here and he said that's what he's been teaching for the last 60 years now this particular expression I don't recall him ever saying but basic idea that something has to come from the level on high otherwise it's, for example in the Bible we have this the wall about which there was much argument and so I think he was particularly emphasizing that special remark but now since I had been particularly invited by him I should also remind some of you here I've forgotten the names of those people from Sweden who was in charge here for some time so maybe you mark you Lily felt they specially invited me for dinner at their place in the evening you may all be surprised they happily served nice wine with the dinner which is strange in the Krishnamurti circles but I'm reminding you not to get so stuck with one thing or the other <laughs> but now you see because I was a guest I was invited so therefore all this was being served very nicely <laughs> so in any case I have told you some of the remarks or exchanges with Krishnamurti in my meetings but the suggestion this is so clearly a remark from the tradition that it the only real understanding can come only from divine revelation rather than my conquering the heaven with my boots on <laughs> walking in that's not the idea therefore always a suggestion various words get used surrendering oneself submitting oneself offering oneself but this is where it becomes very important to also emphasize that something is still required from our side to become more or more receptive even if God is searching for me if I'm running away I don't want to be found then I won't be contacting him so something is very much required from our side and this was actually partly not exactly my arguments for Krishna I was always very touched by his remarks but for me personally I was not very clear what it is that I needed to prepare myself that I can be touched by God after all I have been hanging around now for nearly 85 years I haven't yet been touched by God what the hell is he waiting for what is required from my side that's my question so therefore for me that is the real meaning of preparing oneself to become more and more receptive and I had several exchanges with Krishnamurti about this because he was not very eager to be describing that particularly because for him it's almost as if it instantaneously happened something just descends on you it doesn't hasn't descended on me so I have to honestly say that something is surely required from my side actually on one occasion he even said that the Sun is shining all you need to do is to open the window and I said Krishna ji some windows are painted shut they need to be scraped you are too clever for your own good <laughs> that dismisses the conversation hmm? but my question still remains hmm? what is the scraping that needs to be done and here I give you an example from a great scientist Albert Einstein who was also occasionally asked is creativity or ultimately all a matter of chance or is it a matter of hard work and his response is actually very helpful he says ultimately creativity is a matter of chance but chance seems to favor the prepared that's the thing I'm asking 
how do I prepare myself? It is true that ultimately it's not a question of my conquering heaven or determining to be enlightened or whatever label one wants to attach to it. No, it all has to come from the other side. But am I receptive? Am I willing to receive or am I just running away or covering myself up with blankets so I don't see the sunshine? Therefore, I have an ongoing question about this, about the teaching of Krishnamurti. I think my own impression is that he himself, maybe from previous lives, I don't actually know this. After all, why would Leadbeater be able to select him out of many other urchins on the seashore there? Clearly, there was something extraordinary in him even at the age of, how old was he at that time? 14 years old or something? Hmm? Now, where is it coming from? I don't know. I personally, actually, even in my own life, I say, in fact, I am these days very much even putting some of this together in a book. I myself feel, even having somebody like Krishnamurti spend so much time with me, that I am blessed. I have met some very remarkable people in my life great Zen masters, and Jean de Salzman, the main teacher in the Gurdjieff teaching. Why have they bothered to spend so much time on me? In fact, my partner says maybe I did something in a previous life because she can't see anything in this life to deserve this. <laughs> but clearly, there is a blessing somehow I seem to receive. Why would Krishnamurti spend so much time and energy with me? Similarly, I have a feeling from wherever it is coming from, one doesn't know that, that he seems to have been very early on not greatly efficient in the ordinary intellectual sense. For example, he could not even enter, was it Cambridge or Oxford that he was trying to get into? They wouldn't let him come in because he didn't, his brother succeeded to get in, but he couldn't sit in. So it's not that kind of intelligence we are speaking about. We are really speaking about this intelligence beyond thought <laughs> that, that I initially mentioned here. And, but where it comes from, how, what it depends on, is a whole great mystery as far as I'm concerned. But I invite you to nevertheless to see that personally from my understanding, Krishnamurti was one of the very few people who actually, whether intentionally or by previous lives, etc., in fact, practice the teaching, practice the tradition. Therefore, for him to say that the trouble with India is that the Brahmins have forgotten the tradition is absolutely right. Thank you very much. So please bring your own insights. Some of you, have, particularly I know Mark and Asha, have spent a long time with Krishnamurti, much more than I have. and or. Others have read his books or have heard his talks, so please bring whatever you wish. Or ask a question, I don't mind. Hi. Do you have a favorite, this is not working, do you have a favorite physicist? Have we a favorite physicist? <laughs> Among still alive people? Alive or dead. Alive or dead? My favorite physicist is Einstein. Thank you. In fact, even before I, earlier I was in the technological institutes, not so much studying deep physics, but even there I remember, I was actually very struck by his, something I should mention here as a general. Many of these great scientists, great artists also, make remarks which are not part of science. In fact, I often remind people to what scientists say is not what science says. The reason why I'm mentioning this, because scientists are also human beings. They also fall in love. They're also afraid of death or something or the other. So sometimes even based on what they have understood, they might make some remarks. Like I will now to quote to you a remark of Einstein but I can guarantee you cannot find that in any scientific paper. And similarly, if you, in the next, let us take this on as an exercise. If in the next one year you come across some scientist remarks are quoted, 
if you can then find it in a scientific paper, I will give you a ticket to fly to Nova Scotia to meet me there. Hmm? Because, the th for example, there are scientists who say, to hell with God, God doesn't exist, or some say God exists. You can't find any of this in any scientific paper, because to say anything in a scientific paper means I ought to be able to verify this. Then how the hell do I verify whether God exists or doesn't exist? Scientific research is a whole different enterprise. I, people, I keep reminding people of this. What scientists say is not what science says. Here is a remark of Einstein, you can then quote this here. That the true value of a human being depends on how free one is from his own self. Any Zen master could have said that. Krishnamurti could have said that. But if you can find this in any physics paper or physics book, I, as I said, <laughs> I'll be completely surprised. But scientists are also human beings. We shouldn't deny that fact. <laughs> After all, they are also sometimes touched by something. Okay? So, but Einstein is one of my favorites, but this is one of his remarks here. And there is another one of his, which I question very much, but let me, which is very often quoted, particularly by people in religion. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. This is one of his remarks. Now, the reason why I find it not so acceptable this indicates his understanding of religion. Whereas from the perspective of any spiritual, serious spiritual teaching, the whole purpose of the spiritual teaching is to bring more and more insight. So he says religion without science is blind. The kind of religion he's in, talking about is just in, engaged in action. Hmm. So, but we don't need to be against him. That's the kind of religion he mostly encountered. That's what takes place most of the time. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else wishes to? Ravi, further on your comment about from there to here, uh, we often asked Krishnamurti how to uh, raise children so that they remained vulnerable, susceptible. Hmm. And he said several interesting things. Among them, he said, keep them as vulnerable as long as possible. He said, let them have long, long childhood. And he said, the problem with so many of the great truths of life is that religions, organizations, experts have all made those truths so damn concrete. Yeah. They've taken the subtlety out. They've lost the subtlety. Yes. And I think that's something we we do keep in mind uh, in, in the school, and that is to uh, not constantly be feeding the children with the concrete, yes. but keeping their minds subtle and vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. No, he was actually very critical of organizations in general. In fact, one of the more or less the joke that he would mention. In fact, I heard it two or three times said by him in different places. One was that one little devil saw somebody find a truth. So he says, this little devil says to the big devil, why don't you intervene and do something about this? He says, don't worry, I'll help him organize it. <laughs> <laughs> but ironically, as for, now, Mark, maybe this is the right, you are the right person to speak about this, because at one stage he did not even want to have any organization in his own name either. But there are organizations in his name. Are they now, what are they doing? They're essentially business organizations. <laughs> They're not spiritual, they're religious. <laughs> they just manage the affairs of what he left behind. 
you see, but this is again one of the difficulties is this is not I'm not trying to specially blame this organization or the, every organization is, for example, Krishnamurti organization is around. It's organized around Krishnamurti. So they will be selling his books, not the books of uh, Tikna Khan, <laughs> not the books of Gurjeev. And it's the same the other way around. Gurjeev organization will be selling Gurjeev's books. They're not selling. So this is what happens. It becomes exclusively centered around one teacher or one teaching or one idea. And then forgetting that there is a whole shower of truth <laughs> everywhere. Hmm? And this is one of the difficulties of every organization. It's not specifically Krishnamurti organization problem. Hmm? Anybody else wishes? To? Use the, use oh, the yeah, so that others can hear and I can also hear. Haven't you said in the past that there is a reason for the keepers of the religion or the organization and the practitioners of the religion or the organization? Yes, but the trouble is usually, you see, the practitioners... For example, I give a very simple example here, not to take it so, especially coming from the Catholic background as you are. Look at the history of the popes. Since the church itself decides who is going to be sanctified, how many popes have been sanctified? So, what I'm saying is that you have popes who are not hardly one or two in the whole history of papacy have been actually sanctified even by their own decisions. Hmm? That means that people who are saintly are not really running these organizations. Hmm? And then it is another feature which I think Krishnamurti, we didn't specially talk about it, but I'm sure he would very much agree with this. In, particularly in the Indian tradition, very strong suggestion even by Shankara, who is regarded as the greatest philosopher in India, that when awakening takes place, scripture stops being authoritative. Mm. Similarly, in the Bhagavad Gita, even Krishna says something very similar to this. Hmm? So, scripture is said to be helpful as long as it can help, but awakening is something which goes beyond scripture. But now, imagine saying this in the Catholic Church or in the Islamic tradition, you'll be in real trouble. The reason I'm saying this, that what then becomes something which is written down once, maybe 2000 years ago in a certain language and certain event in history, that becomes the cutting edge of everything. And now the language has changed. <laughs> which is why I particularly like, there is a remark, actually a haiku of Masho, the great haiku writer in Japan in the 17th century. He says that, don't seek to follow the footsteps of the wise of old. Seek what they sought. Hmm? So we need to seek truth, God, not necessarily this is the tradition, this is the teaching, this is the kind of clothing you should wear, this is the kind of food you should eat, etc., etc., you know, or this is the recitation, say, the Nicene Creed or this or that. Particularly, I mean, kids are hardly out of diapers who have to say all this. <laughs> so that's the tragedy of the traditions, really. So. In a way, coming back to this remark of Krishnamurti that traditions have betrayed is also true. But on the other hand, him saying that tr trouble with India is that the Brahmins have forgotten the tradition is also true. So he was one of the very few Brahmins who did not forget the tradition. Yeah, this lady here. Yes. Thank you. Ravidji, the, um, the question that keeps coming into my mind is you spoke about the scraping of the paint on the window. What has been your experience since then 
of scraping the paint on the windowsill. Yeah. Well, one thing that I should have maybe added here, this was not at that moment when I raised that question with him, but another time he said, if you see that the house is on fire, you will break the window and go out. So for me now, particularly at my age now, more and more clarity that the house is on fire. And therefore, wishing really to not to be occupied with understanding this or not understanding that, but just undertaking whatever really speaks to my heart. So, but young people don't quite realize that the house is on fire as easily <laughs> as the older people can. But that was his remark. Partly, some of the times it was a way of stopping a conversation, but sometimes it was a way of elucidating something or clarifying something. Hmm? But thank you for your question. Yeah. So you see, if one is actually in the house and it's on fire, then you don't worry about scraping it. Hmm? Ravi, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Please. The, so you were kind of talking about the other, right? Something from the other side kind of coming in. Um, and then you were also mentioning when Kay was saying, you know, the sun is shining. So, you know, it seems like this other that's coming in or the sun shining is is here now it's not some you know it would seem it's not some sort of far off imagining or super god or it may be it may be but my question to you is is this other here now and you know the this idea that i have to do scraping or make some kind of effort or you know is that the kind of is that the kind of activity of that we find ourselves in like meaning are we just sort of god deniers are we in a way or are we are we other the this other are we other deniers uh by thinking that there's something to do so i just I wonder what you would have to say about that yes. and how it fit in with what you were no, saying earlier. No, it's a very helpful question. Let me first of all remind one remark which every religion at any level, whether at a serious spiritual level or just in the churches or mosques, everybody says, God is omnipresent. What does that mean? So God is right here all around me, inside me. It is easy to say this, but then if it is true, which every religion says, if it is true, how come I am not being touched by this? This is where, from my point of view, what is really required is more and more receptivity from my side. As an example, deeper and deeper relaxation, physical relaxation, of course, but more importantly, emotional relaxation, freedom from anxiety, worry. In fact, all tensions are self-assertions. Similarly, freedom from intellectual that relaxation also because I occasionally remind people that even if I had the combined intelligence of Einstein, Aristotle, Shankara and Nagarjuna I would still not be able to know all there is to know. So how to be free, in fact this was one of the things Krishnamurti I should have also mentioned here, freedom from what one knows. This is a very fundamental idea. Actually, the oldest Upanishad 
partly now coming back to the talk, I should have mentioned this earlier, the older Upanishad, which is Brahadaranik Upanishad, actually says those who are addicted to ignorance are in a great darkness, but those who are addicted to knowledge are in a greater darkness. And it's repeated in a later Upanishad, the Ishavasi Upanishad as well. So, but coming back to the question that you're raising, from my point of view, the scraping of the window, what is required is how can I become more and more receptive? That, for example, is my understanding of whatever I mean by meditation. Not only physical relaxation, but can my mind be a little free of knowing this and that? Maybe for good reason or bad reason, I read hell of a lot of things. For the last at least almost 10 years, I hardly read any book or anything else like this. I'm just not interested in this. Because my impression is if I can know, understand even one teaching of the Buddha or Christ or Krishnamurti and actually let it live in me, that is much more important than reading a hundred books. So something is still required from my side to become more and more receptive. And in this context, maybe this will amuse some of you, but traditionally, just because really based on the kind of a genitalia, activity was associated with males and receptivity with females. So the suggestion really was, we have a very classical poet in India from the 16th century called Mira. His po her poetry is still sometimes read by people very much. And one famous yogi was visiting, she wanted to meet him, and he said, no, he doesn't want to be near any female. And she said to him, Yogi, I would have thought that in the presence of Krishna, we are all females, all receptive. And this so much touched this Yogi that he became her student after that. He really understood this. So this suggestion, this is the reason why the Lord of Yoga, Shiva, actually is shown as half male, half female. How do we bring activity and receptivity together so that the higher energy which is coming, associate, which is God gets called he, especially in the Abrahamic tradition. Why not she? <laughs> Why not it? But partly because of this activity and therefore to become more and more receptive requires deeper relaxation, more and more freedom from my knowledge, from my anxiety and worry, so that this subtle energy can actually descend. Thank you very much. I think we should probably stop. Unless somebody else has a play some flute. Yeah. Yeah, maybe he can play a piece for a few moments. It's a friend of mine. I'm always happy to have him play something.
थैंक यू वेरी मच एवरीबडी